The Disney Company's current obsession with remaking their animated classics as live action movies is no secret. At first I thought it was a cool idea, but it got old. Fast. So today I want to sort of trace back the live action journey and explore why exactly that is. Let's get into it. The first Disney live action remake came back in 1994 in the form of The Jungle Book. It's not a very good film, but it's so different from Disney's previous take on The Jungle Book that I believe it has a reason to exist. In this movie, Mowgli is an adult, he's in love with Cersei Lannister, and the animals don't talk. This movie seems to have been made from a genuine desire to explore a different facet of Mowgli's character and journey. It wasn't a carbon copy of the 1967 animated film. It took elements from that movie that audiences were familiar with and showed them something new. This is what the initial spirit of the live action adaptation was, and Disney has strayed far from it. 101 Dalmatians was the next live action adaptation. It released in 1996 and focused much more on the human characters as the dogs don't talk. I thought it was interesting to get a closer look at Roger and Anita, and Glenn Close feels like she was born to play Cruella. The movie overall is just okay, but her performance makes it worthwhile. Take the drawing from Anita and hand it to me! Is that difficult? This movie turned out to be a hit, making $320 million. This unfortunately led Disney to release a sequel in the year 2000, and it's pretty bad. It doesn't really fall into the remake category though, seeing as it's a continuation. Disney surprisingly didn't make another live action adaptation for 10 years, but this is where the trajectory really changes. In 2010, Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland released, and it was a smash hit, making over a billion dollars. Here's the thing with this movie. I don't like it at all, but it doesn't piss me off the way most of the other remakes do because it really did something different with the Alice in Wonderland story. I may not like what they did with it, but it wasn't just a regurgitated copy of Disney's animated version. Tim Burton, the film's director, said that the goal is to try to make it an engaging movie where you get some of the psychology and kind of bring a freshness but also keep the classic nature of Alice. He felt detached from the 1951 version because of its episodic nature, so he tried to give the story some framework of emotional grounding and to try and make Alice feel more like a story as opposed to a series of events. And that right there is all I ask. Burton saw potential to improve and expand on the story and its characters. He had an actual goal and a vision for it. Not to mention, he brings such a unique, signature visual style to his films. I'm not personally a fan of it, but it made a lot of sense for Wonderland. I wouldn't say that everything they tried in this film worked, because I don't think the end product was all that great, but I'm glad that they at least tried. The box office success of Alice in Wonderland could not be ignored. It showed Disney that they may have discovered a strategy to bring in a heavy cash flow, so they tried it again. In 2014, Maleficent hit theaters. This one is a retelling of the events of Sleeping Beauty, but from Maleficent's perspective. I have complicated feelings about this one. I think it performed character assassination on Maleficent, making the mistress of evil into a sympathetic hero. They didn't even let her be the one to turn into the dragon for God's sake. If I try to ignore what I know about Maleficent from the 1959 Sleeping Beauty though, it's not so bad. I actually think Maleficent is a decent movie. It really took advantage of the opportunity to explore something different based on the Sleeping Beauty story. So even though I'm not a fan of the creative choices that were made, I'm glad that there was still a unique vision and this wasn't simply a copy. Maleficent made over 750 million at the box office. It wasn't quite as successful as Alice, but it was still a hit by industry standards, and it solidified for Disney that this live action trend was going to be very lucrative for them. Moving forward, Disney would put out at least one live action remake per year, and they aren't showing signs of stopping anytime soon. The next one to release was Cinderella. I'm going to skip this one for now and talk about it at the end, because as you may have guessed from the video's title, this is the only one I think is truly good and did everything right. So let's put a pin in that and resume trashing these movies. In 2016, Jon Favreau's take on The Jungle Book released. So we're already remaking the same film twice at this point.
This one is a lot more loyal to the 1967 animated film, but it does have enough differences that I feel like it still has an argument for its existence. I personally think changing the ending was a mistake though. Mowgli decides to stay in the jungle instead of going to the man village. When asked about the change, Favreau said, The idea that Mowgli rejects the jungle is not the theme that I wanted. I wanted to show that you can be a human being and still be part of the circle of life. Decisions are made by Mowgli that establish that he has respect for the world around him and an appreciation for it and learns to be part of it without ever pretending to be part of the animal kingdom. He also said that it leaves the door open for further continuation of the adventures of Mowgli and his friends. So it looks like it was a mixture of a creative choice and a practical one. Favreau also expressed that he didn't like the original ending when he was younger because it felt like a bummer. And I have to laugh because that's kind of the whole point. I'm not a Jungle Book expert, but I thought the story was an allegory for growing up and learning to accept hard truths and painful experiences. Mowgli leaving the jungle feels like a bummer because it is one, but it's part of life. How many of us loved getting older, leaving childhood behind for real world responsibility? I'd wager not many of us, but it's what we must do. Imagine if Alice stayed in Wonderland, or if Wendy stayed in Neverland. Their experiences in their films led them to the conclusion that they must return to where they belong and accept growing up. So it's not exclusively about Mowgli rejecting the jungle. The jungle represents his youth, which he must move on from. It becomes universal. Just cause it doesn't feel good to us doesn't mean it's the wrong ending for the story. It challenges us. I think most of us would love to see Mowgli stay in the jungle and have fun with his friends, but then what was the purpose of the story? It seems like Favreau was taking a more literal take on the jungle. He wanted to display themes of coexistence and harmony with nature. I think he was well intentioned, but it kind of makes the whole movie fall apart for me. Admittedly, The Jungle Book is my second favorite live action remake, but there's a huge gap between it and Cinderella, and the ending is the main reason why. I won't talk about Alice Through the Looking Glass much because it's a sequel to the first live action film and not a remake of the 1951 Alice. So like with 102 Dalmatians, I don't think it's good, but I don't have the same critiques for it as the other live action adaptations. Enter Beauty and the Beast. I consider this another turning point in the live action remake trend trajectory. This was the first renaissance movie to be remade, and in doing this, Disney discovered the true power of 90s kid millennial nostalgia. This is where they sort of realized that they didn't have to do these outside the box reimaginings. They could basically copy paste the animated version into the live action format, add one or two new elements, and people would show up in droves. I'll never forget the first teaser that came out for this movie, because I fell for it hard. I saw that imagery, I heard that bit of score, and I was frothing at the mouth. It seemed like a fantastic idea. We all love these movies, so why not revisit them and have a great time celebrating them? What I quickly realized when I was in the theater watching the movie was, oh, this is so similar to the animated version, only it's so much worse. I could not shake the thought that I'd just way rather be watching the original, because if it's this similar, what's the point? It's essentially the same thing, just without any of the charm that comes with animation. I think the casting of Emma Watson was a mistake. She seemed like the right choice on paper, but they really should have found someone who captured the spirit of Belle, not someone who had brown hair and had previously played an iconic, intelligent character. And maybe someone who didn't need so much auto-tune on their singing. I'm not looking to take Emma Watson down because I really do like her, but the singing really took me out of the film. Alarming. I thought most of the castings were off in this movie, aside from maybe Gaston and LeFou. To the movie's credit, they did still try a bit to incorporate some new things, but most of them were just attempts to fill in plot holes or explorations of irrelevant story threads. Ultimately, I found it distracting, and all these elements diluted the potency of the originally simplistic theme. The connection between Belle and Beast didn't work nearly as well either. In the 1991 version, Beast decides to surprise Belle with his library as a genuine gift because he's begun to care for her, and he knows how she loves to read. He's visibly excited at getting to do this for her, and altogether it's just a lovely moment that creates a strong foundation for their developing relationship. 
In the live action version, Beast scoffs at Belle's taste in books and shows her the library as a gotcha moment on a whim. It's like he's showing off to her, and it doesn't have any of the heart that's so vital to believing in and rooting for their relationship. It also feels a lot ickier that Belle is into Beast when he looks realistic. That should have stayed in animation. How would you feel about growing a beard? <laughs> The last thing I'll mention is what I believe to be the biggest offense this movie makes. Why take so many things directly from the animated version and then draw the line at what is probably the most clever animation design from that version? The spout is her nose? No thanks, we'll just slap her face on the side of the teapot, thank you very much. I'm gonna skim over Christopher Robin and Dumbo for the most part. Christopher Robin is honestly a perfectly fine movie. I'm not mad about it, and it's not guilty of what most of these other adaptations are. The only thing is that when I rewatched it, I found it mind-numbingly boring and dull. The visuals are just a bit drab, and the story moves at a sluggish pace. That's just me though, I can see people being a fan of this. Dumbo is a little confusing because I don't think there was much interest in this one. The original movie is quite short though, so there was a lot of opportunity to expand on the story. If I'm being honest though, I've only seen this movie once and I barely remember it. I believe I was somewhat pleased that they came up with new story elements and it wasn't just a copy, but I don't see why we needed this. It came and went and nobody thinks about it. Next up is Aladdin. This continued in the direction that Beauty and the Beast set out in, except it seemed even more determined to be a copy of its animated counterpart. I once again could not shake the desire to be watching the animated movie instead. It had everything I love about Aladdin, just done poorly. This isn't even the fault of the filmmakers. It maybe could have been done better, but I think it's impossible to make a live action adaptation of a movie like Aladdin and have it truly be any good because the medium of animation is what made movies like Aladdin so good in the first place. Howard Ashman saw what a perfect marriage the medium of animation and the Broadway musical was. They complemented each other so well because animation makes it so much easier to suspend our disbelief. Animals can sing and we don't bat an eye. We get these wonderful, bright, grand, and creative showcases because we can. There aren't any limits in animation. And then when it's attempted in live action, it's such a letdown. It suddenly feels silly and dull, and all we're left with is a feeling of longing for the original. Genie as a character was also made to be in an animated film. He's larger than life, can't be contained, and then the new Aladdin took that away from him. The channel Sideways has a great video covering the flaws in the music of the live action remakes, and I particularly like the point he makes about the absurdity of casting someone like Will Smith as the genie, and then instead of letting him bring his own unique spin on the character, they relegate him to doing a poor Robin Williams impression. That's just a setup for failure. Nobody is going to live up to William's version, so instead of half-assing an impossible task, why not just do a fresh take that at least has a chance to be of value? I won't dwell on Aladdin for too long, but I have to mention Jafar. He's the single worst part of the remake, which is surprising to me, but he has zero villainous presence in the movie. The actor they cast had no charisma in the role, and as a result, Jafar is just a lame shell of the fun and threatening villain we know and love. He's been pretending the entire time. An imposter. <laughs> now it's time for The Lion King, the single worst offender of all my critiques of these live action remakes. It also made the most money of any of them, so isn't that just fantastic? If I've been complaining that some of these movies are basically copies of their animated counterparts, The Lion King takes that to a whole other level. It's almost a shot for shot recreation of the 1994 animated masterpiece with all the soul sucked out of it. This isn't even technically live action. It's a 100% computer animated photorealistic nature documentary, which is why it looks so dumb when the animals break into song. That level of separation that suspends our disbelief is gone. Not to mention, the lions fail to emote or properly react to anything in the film. All the cool, innovative designs are gone, 
all the fun and colorful sequences are gone, all the brilliant voice acting is gone, barring James Earl Jones who just turns in a weaker version of his original performance, and all the heart and emotion is gone. It's a ghost of the 1994 film. Most of these other movies bother me, but I'm like whatever. This one is different. This one is a true abomination, and I'm mad that it has a place in the top 10 highest grossing films. But the money is precisely why all of my critiques of these remakes are pointless, especially this one. They aren't made from an authentic desire to create good, meaningful art. Disney doesn't care if the movie is good. They care if people go see it so they can make a billion dollars. And because we're all silly nostalgic people, we do just that. I know it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of the world, but I hate that Disney gets rewarded for making such empty garbage movies. I'm skipping over Maleficent Mistress of Evil because it's a sequel. That title is laughable though after they de-vilified her in the first one. Lady and the Tramp was included with Disney Plus at its launch, I guess to entice more people to subscribe? This one felt lower stakes, so I feel pretty indifferent to it. In all honesty, it wasn't as bad as I was expecting. Once you get past the absurdity of the dogs talking, it's watchable. At least they used real dogs so it's not such a CGI fest. It just never needed to be made though. It doesn't have even an ounce of the charm of the 1955 version. For some reason, I had not yet learned my lesson and had genuine hope that Mulan was gonna be good. A lot of people were upset when it was announced that there wouldn't be any songs in the film, but to me, that signaled that they were committing to the darker tones of the story. I was totally on board, but the movie just wasn't good. It was different enough that it didn't just constantly make me think of the original and how much better it is, even though it is way better, but some of the creative choices made fell completely flat. There's this weird narrative where Mulan is guilt tripped for pretending to be something she's not. Mulan wants to be able to show who she authentically is, but in this scene, it doesn't make sense. Her male disguise was a very necessary and practical choice, but the script shows her having this realization that she must be true, and so she sheds her armor and lets her hair down, emerging as this almost superhero type figure. I can tell they were going for female empowerment, which is never a bad thing, but the execution was so out of place here. The moment felt more like a fantasy than something that could actually happen. The most positive thing about Mulan is that it looks pretty nice visually at times, but that's about it. The latest film in this collection is Cruella. This is a prequel backstory type film for Cruella, so at least it can't be a direct replica of 101 Dalmatians. We already got a live action version of that anyways. The problem is, why? Why did Cruella need an origin story? The beauty of most of Disney's villains is their simplicity. They're evil because they just are. We don't really question it or ask why. Some people may not like that, and if we were talking anything other than Disney, especially their fairy tale movies, I wouldn't like it either. But Disney deals in good and evil. And as soon as you start fleshing out the villains with a sympathetic story, they're no longer evil. When Disney did this with Maleficent, she straight up became the hero. And a similar thing happened here with Cruella, to a lesser extent. I think we just have to separate this Cruella from the classic one that we know, because this story doesn't connect with her very well. I'll admit it was creative, and there were some cool costumes, stylistic choices, and visuals, so I'm not upset about this one really. Plus, I love Emma Stone. I still can't believe they made dogs push her mom off a cliff. Girl, bye. Okay, we did it. We made it through that mountain of negativity and have arrived at the singular shining jewel, Kenneth Branagh's Cinderella. I don't just think this movie is good in comparison to the other live action adaptations. I find it to be a genuinely high quality film. Dare I say it even improves on its source material. The first reason I think this works is because of the Cinderella story. It's simple and it's versatile. The countless Cinderella adaptations over the years are a testament to this. The fairy tale of Cinderella is a bare bones story, and that's not a knock on it because that's exactly what it was meant to be. It's basic, but it's powerful, relatable, and effective. This makes it a strong foundation to expand upon, and that's just what this movie does, but it doesn't take it too far. The characters all resemble their original forms, but we get to see a whole lot more of them. 
Screenwriter Chris Weitz hit this perfect balance of bringing a new life to the story and characters while completely maintaining the spirit of classic Cinderella. I think it brought a lot to our connection with Cinderella that we got to see her with her parents and then be with her through losing them. We see a lot more of the extent to which Cinderella gives away more and more of herself until she can no longer bear it. The prince is an actual character in this movie and he's a superb match for Cinderella. They challenge each other, but they share core values, and it's moving the way Kit is so drawn to her goodness. They're sweet and humble with each other, and interactions like this melt my heart a little bit. Will you take me as I am? An honest country girl who loves you. Of course I will. <laughs> I enjoyed getting to see Kit's relationship with his father as well. Their final scene together is so touching. I just love everything about what they did with Kit. He shows such a positive depiction of an iconic male character. He values love and kindness, and he shows emotional vulnerability. Richard Madden really sold it for me. Lady Tremaine was also handled wonderfully here. We got a bit more of a peek into why she's so cruel, but they didn't try to make her all sympathetic. She has her reasons, but she's still a selfish, clear-cut villain that Cinderella overcomes. Her goodness triumphs over Tremaine's cruelty, and their final interaction is pitch perfect. Because you are young, and innocent, and good, and I... Cape Blanchett was great, as usual. The movie has notes of the 1950 film score, but it's largely an original score by Patrick Doyle, and a beautiful one at that. There are also little nods to the songs from the animated version, but this Cinderella is not a musical. I think that was smart because the 1950 Cinderella wasn't a Broadway style musical, so the songs weren't necessary to the story or character development. They're great songs, but they would be more of a distraction than anything in the live action version. By including little hints to the songs, we still get that nostalgia scratch itched without feeling like we're experiencing a lower quality version of something beloved. Visually, this film is gorgeous to look at. It feels rich, as opposed to the lifelessness of other remakes. It feels both grand and intimate, and the production design is excellent. I'm a huge fan of the animated Cinderella, but one of my issues with that movie is the heavy focus on the mice and Lucifer. And wouldn't you know, the 2015 Cinderella addressed that too. Those elements are certainly still present, but they take a back seat in a major way, which I'm grateful for. Lucy Bevan was the casting director for this film, and I think she deserves a massive pat on the back for her work here. The cast is a big reason why this adaptation works, particularly the casting of Lily James. I didn't know who she was before this, and I remember being a little put off initially because I didn't think she looked like Cinderella. It's safe to say I got over that quickly, because what's much more important than looking like a character is capturing their spirit, and James certainly embodied the spirit of Cinderella. She put out the most lovely, benevolent, and likable vibes. Something about her is so heartwarming, and you only want to see good things happen to her. For these live action adaptations, it seems like a much better idea to cast lesser known actors because it's much less distracting. They have a much better chance of making us believe the character. It's a little bit odd though because Lucy Bevan also cast a lot of the other live action remakes and I don't think the casting has always been that strong. She did Beauty and the Beast, which I think is the most miscast of them all. We really can't blame her for the Emma Watson casting though. The president of production for Disney, Sean Bailey, said that Watson was the first and only choice of Walt Disney Studios chairman Alan F. Horn, who had previously run Warner Brothers, which released the eight Harry Potter films that starred Watson as Hermione Granger. Ewan McGregor as Lumiere was her fault, though. Then who'd have guessed they'd come together on their own? It's so peculiar. The ironic thing is, for all my complaining over it, I'm actually thrilled Watson was cast as Belle because it caused her to drop out of La La Land, which is my favorite movie of all time, and I'm sure it would not be the same without Emma Stone. Funny enough, Ryan Gosling was set to play Beast but dropped out for his role in La La Land. Well, well, well. How the turntables... The last thing I'll talk about with Cinderella is the theme. When Ella's mother is dying, she tells her daughter to have courage and be kind. 
she lets her know that there's power in kindness, and that theme carries through and becomes the mantra of the film. It's the core value that brings Ella and Kit together, and it's just such a lovely thing to root for. This movie could have been really corny and easily brushed off, but everyone from the cast and crew did their job with such a care and a level of quality that it translates directly into the film, elevating the theme and allowing it to resonate profoundly. This movie acknowledges that sometimes it requires courage to be kind. Sometimes it's really hard. It celebrates kindness and it rewards goodness. It's something that has found its way into my heart and has truly made an impact. This is everything that the spirit of the Cinderella story should be, and it's exactly what a live action adaptation should strive to be. It's based on and inherently tied to the source material, but it's also its own. Somebody saw true potential and value in further exploring this story. They didn't just have dollar signs in their eyes. I don't think every Disney animated movie can be made into a good live action adaptation, but Cinderella showed us that it's possible. I'm very doubtful that it will ever be matched in future attempts, but I'd be happy to be proven wrong. The release of The Little Mermaid remake is approaching, and just know that my asshole is clenched. Bruh. And with that, I've said my piece. I did however want to mention, if you're someone that enjoys any or all of these live action adaptations, that's completely fine. My opinion is definitely not an authority, and if you enjoy something, that's a good thing. This was a topic I had a lot of thoughts on, so that's why I wanted to make a video on it. I really mostly wanted to praise Cinderella, but I couldn't do that properly without first outlining the flaws I saw in the rest of the remakes. What I think might be the case for a lot of people is they haven't watched the animated version in years, so watching these live action adaptations is a fun way to indulge in nostalgia. They see the movie, they think it's fun, they don't ever think about it again. This is totally fine, and it doesn't have to be that deep. I just like to complain sometimes. If you enjoyed this video, consider hitting like and subscribe, and make sure to tell me your favorite Disney live action adaptation in the comments below. You can also head over to the Trove to check out more video essays, rankings, trivia videos, and more. I'll have links to playlists in the description down below. We'll have to see how the new Pinocchio movie is. It's releasing September 8th on Disney+, and I'm gonna say that I'm keeping my hopes very low. Something about the CGI creeps me out. Anyways, thanks again for hanging out, and I'll see you next time.